You're recording our level checks, Gary. Uh, no, but I am recording now. This is the best. The best commentary we get is during the level checks. Uh, okay? that's sadly we got, true. We got to yeah. We yeah we for our younger listeners, um, they learned how to count to three from yep. Carlton, and Neil gave a very thorough uh you know explanation of the date and time. Yes, yes, he did. Uh, I talked about Lunchables in your fridge. Mm-hmm. And you didn't talk about anything. No, nope, I didn't nope. even get a sound check from you. De- describe your perfect date: April fifteenth. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. You just need a light jacket. Yep, very good, Neil. Oh, son of a bitch! It's on the tip of my tongue. Somebody's a movie buff. Miss Congeniality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's definitely a classic. Definitely, yes, it is. Definitely a a movie classic for the ages. Uh, everybody should see if they haven't. It's all right. It's 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 fine. It, it's fine. It's that's, fine. That's fine. It's okay. It's 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 not bad. It's 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 mediocre there. It's mediocre. All right. Let's get rolling since that's, you know, that's what we do. We we get rolling here because we love to talk and and chat with our friends and it's just a good old time. I really don't know what to say for the banter, so I'm just going to go into it. Okay. I'm yeah. really tired right now. There you go. So, fuck it. Drink you know? your coffee, Johnny. That, I, I should. I really should chug the hell out of this, but it's really hot. It's very, very and, hot I mean, it's, it's It's scalding. I'm, I burned my tongue earlier. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of I Don't Give a Flick. I am your host, Johnny Blackburn, and alongside me are my co-hosts, as they are every week. Gary Elmore. And Neil Riley. And this week, we are privileged to have with us a uh, local and national as well, actor, Mr. Uh, Carlton Cottle. Carlton, welcome back to the show. Hey, All right. good to be here. Hey, Carlton, am I saying your last name correctly? Am I pronouncing that? I, I always always feel like I get it wrong. How, how, do, how do you say it? I just want to make sure I'm not an idiot and being a doofus here mispronouncing it. Well, I didn't hear what you said, so I guess you did it right. So Coddle is my... Uh, Coddle. Okay, I did. Yes, my, perfect. My surname. Yes. Okay. Every time I... Honestly, every time I see it, I want to say the... I, not that I not that I have dyslexia, but maybe I do because I, I want to say Claude every time I see it, just because oh, it's no, no, it's, yeah, no, I, I know, no, no, <laughs> I, I know it's not quite far off. <laughs> well, the the L has just moved, uh, you know. I don't know. Oh man. Anyways, uh, <laughs> um, and we will also hopefully be uh, welcoming uh, LA-based producer Kapil Mahendra and uh, Chicago-based filmmaker Matthew Strand Jordan a little later in the episode. Uh, they currently uh, were caught up uh, at the airport, so we're hoping they get to make it to, uh, here later in the episode. But uh, time is of the essence, and time is money, and we were all busy men, so we must get the show rolling. On the road. On the road, yes. On the road, On road again. again. That is freaky as hell, because... We just literally looked at each other and started singing that. I mean, like, you know, what else are you going to sing? That's, I mean, you could sing all those really famous songs about being on the road. Yeah. About being on the street. <laughs> well, being on the street is a little different than being on the road. Living on the street. Living sing, on the what? street. But a beat up, beat up, beat up, beat up, love such an old fashioned word. And no death. Okay. Is that right. a song? Or did you just make that up? Yes, that's a Queen song. Oh my God. Is it? Yes, it is. I'm hor- I miss Miss Congeniality, yeah. and then I miss Queen. What the hell is wrong I'm with you, horrible, Johnny? I'm, Are I'm you just, on I'm drugs? I'm so far off my fucking game tonight, it's not even funny. And it's uh, really not funny, because Neil's not laughing, and if Neil's not laughing, then I know it's just... Then it's not funny. funny. That's exactly, true. that's my point. <laughs> Neil that's, is our comedic barometer. He is, and if, if it's not... <laughs> Gary, <laughs> comedic barometer. Oh, uh, uh, you, you guys are just so more wonderful. fun than a barrel of fucking monkeys, aren't you? We just got comedians all over the fucking place. Uh, if you haven't figured it out at this point, everybody, uh, explicit content and language is accepted in this podcast, so if you have children under the age of 10, we, uh, we definitely uh, encourage you to let them listen so they understand how the real world works and yeah. how to speak to their elders. So. Yep. Uh, <laughs> on, uh, on this week's episode, we are going to, uh, due to the, uh, the, the current uh, nature of the upcoming presidential election, and since we've all got uh, politics and government and elections on our mind, uh, that is the subject of tonight's episode, is uh, presidential and government films, and films of that variety. 
So, uh, Gary, actually, this was, um, typically we kind of all chat and come up with the topic, but this is one you had suggested the other day. Right. Um, so what was, had you been itching to talk about this one for a while or just because we're, well, I mean, I, I think, and, you know, it only comes around once every four years. Sure. And I, I think government films are really, um, you know, films about the president or government are really interesting, uh, because, uh, at least in the United States, uh, you know, the president is sort of the head of the executive branch, um, you know, and they're really sort of the, uh, the symbol uh, of, of the country. So I, I think that really when you, when you see, when you have a good movie about uh, politics, you know, it can be very exciting because politics, like nobody watches C-SPAN because, you know, that's what politics, you know, should be, you know, just really <laughs> boring and nobody wants to pay attention to it. Uh, but when you turn the you know, those kind of stories into the, the elements of drama, it can be really uh, an exciting thing to watch and to understand. And I, I think that there have been some of the best dramas made um, with politics in mind. Sure. And yeah. I'd like to discuss those today. Oh, well, yes. I, I, you yeah. know, I just assumed we'd talk about our, our favorite uh, audio and boom operators of oh, all time. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe the best key grips that ever walked across. We're going to have to do lighting and sound at some point. Yes, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not, yeah. Maybe not. Maybe not tonight's episode. I would say Mike Lunt is my favorite key grip. Yeah. Did you just look that up? Is he f- an actual person, or did you? Is I he just made that up, one hundred percent. But it could have been oh. true. Oh, okay. <laughs> Gary! <laughs> oh, no. oh, that barometer is about to break. You're just you're just on point tonight, there, aren't you? Oh man. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, so so uh, kind of a little bit. So I do want to go ahead and uh, veer over to Carl- Carlton real quick. Uh, Carlton, we had you on uh, about a month and a half ago, I'd say, about two months ago here. At this point for our episode, um, Never Stop Dreaming or I did Never Give Up on Never Too Late to Follow Your Dreams. There you, something like there that. you go. <laughs> Neil, that's why we pay you the big bucks, baby. Um, and, uh, yeah, so we had you on that episode. And uh, just since then, uh, we do want to, you know, we'd like for our listeners to uh, follow and catch up with our guests. What have you been up to recently? What's been going on for you in the months of September and October here? Well, let's see. Uh, really good stuff, actually. Some good stuff. So I just wrapped on Texas Kill City, where I play the chief of police in that movie. Mm-hmm. And I just wrapped on his stretch of uh, Texas Ground, which is the sequel to my stretch of Texas Ground, which is available on Netflix right now. But just wrapped on that movie, sequel two. And then I'm about to start uh, another police movie. I'll be the chief of police in Triple D's Revenge. Uh, it'll start shooting real soon. So I'm, I'm about to hit hit that really hard. I'm, I got, um, you know, about elbow deep in scripts on that one. <laughs> And then just just for uh, grins and giggles, I'll tell you what I got coming out. Robert or Rodriguez's movie uh, "We Can Be Heroes," which is part of Hell the yeah. um, Shark Boy Lava Girl. I'm in that. You can catch me in that one, and that'll be out on, on Hulu pretty soon. And then one night in Miami, which is uh, Regina King's directorial movie debut. She's directed Ooh. TV shows, but this is her first movie to do. Okay. And you can catch me in that. It opened actually last month on a soft opening over in Europe, just for the film festivals, and it did very well, and it'll be coming here to theaters pretty soon. Very nice, very nice. Perfect, man. Uh, so, it looks like we lost Carlton. Oh. Um, oh, no. So he must have he must have cut out. Uh, I, I think the he said the Wi-Fi at his hotel is kind of spotty and such. See, that's the danger of traveling and being successful, ladies and gentlemen. That's you true. never know if you're going to have reliable Wi-Fi. That's why we at Leadfeather prefer to just stay at home and do yes. our podcast where we know the Wi-Fi is strong. Right. And the outside world cannot hurt us. Exactly. We can just stay wrapped in our, our little bubbles and... And there you have it. And there you have it. And that's all I really have to say on that. Neil? Uh, I agree. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> Bubbles are wonderful. So, uh, uh, as we uh, as we wait for uh, this Carlton is, to come this back, that's why we need guests. Because when it's just the three of us, we just talk about Bu- random shits, and I, we just I go on tangents for yeah, nothing. I, I think that's what people like most about us. So, let's get into let's get into the topic, shall we? So, let's jump into it. Go yeah, ahead. So, uh, so what um, what do we can? Cons- and he's back. There oh, he Carlton, is. Carlton, hey, how you doing? Hey, oh my hey. god! Did any of that come out? Did, did, did you hear any? Of that? Uh, yeah, yeah. You said you said you were nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oscar Meyer Wiener called. Yes, they want to give you a big weenie. Oh yes. yeah, baby. All right. All right. Congratulations. Yeah, that's, that's what we all. That's what we all need in our lives is a extra a big, big weenie. weenie. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I think we had we had we were going off on some random banter that had nothing to do with the topic, uh, and we were saying that's why we need guests to to keep us in tra- keep us online, right? Uh, so, right. so yeah, we we left off with Regina King's directorial debut. Uh, and okay, where you were at yeah. And then, and I, well, next my next thing was that I've got one more film coming out. It's called Twelve Mighty Orphans. I'm excited about that one. It's got Luke Wilson, and it's got Martin Sheen in it. It also has um, Robert Duvall. Uh, some real, real class acts and big guns there, and I got a, I got a good scene in that, and that'll be coming out in theaters around Christmas time. Fantastic, oh, man! Wow. God, it, it, it yeah. I'm, I'm, I really, I really am over the moon for you, man. That's fantastic that that you've just literally been nonstop one thing after another. That's great. Um, and speaking of, with uh, the great Martin Sheen, uh, yes. we'll be, uh, we will be probably mentioning West Wing tonight at yes. many different points. Um, and he right. may or may not make an appearance on the podcast. Yeah, I mean, Carlton knows him. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A cup, that's a cup right. of coffee with, uh, screw a cup of car- coffee with John Lovitz. We'll get a cup of coffee with Martin. Uh, or Josiah Martin. Yeah. Lots and bagels with uh, Martin Sheen. Yeah. Uh, or genuinely, genuinely nice guy. I'll tell you to work with him. He's a professional and, again, just... Just a, a really nice guy. I saw the way he treated everybody on set, and of course, this, he's got the, uh, you know, he's got sure. the background and the and everything else to do what he wants when he's on a set, and he doesn't uh, act like it. He just he's just a regular Joe, and I like it. I like him a Perfect, lot. Man. Yeah. How was it to work with? How was it to work with Luke Wilson? I always felt that he would be. A, did we lose him again? Yeah. Oh, there he is. No, I was saying, uh, how how was it to work with Luke Wilson? I always felt like he might be a bit of a dick because he's always in the shadow of his uh, older and much more <laughs> successful and attractive brother, uh, Owen there. No, I'm totally kidding. Uh, how yeah, was it working yeah, with him? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he's, he's, he's absolutely horrible. I'd never want to work with him. No, he's no, kidding, kidding. No. Um, yeah. Actually, really nice guy. Uh, a, a, a very nice guy. He's kind of, kind of one of those kind of guys that you... His persona in his acting actually is is true. If you've seen like something like uh, I guess a um, uh, Legally Blonde or whatever, sure. he's kind of like that. Very very shy type of uh, personality, but yeah, very very friendly. Actually, very good guy. Yeah, great, fantastic yeah. man. I, I'm yeah. So uh, in the uh, Robert Rodriguez film, I was it's actually funny. I finally got around to reading uh, Rebel Without a Crew, and where it talked about how the making of um, my uh, love. Um, Mariachi, Mariachi, Mariachi yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. That's just fantastic, man. Um, but uh, what part did you play in the the Shark Boy and Lava Girl spinoff? I am actually playing the the fire chief, oh, okay. and the city is Austin in this case. Okay, and Big um, surprise. <laughs> it's it, and so uh, my scene um, is with the actual city mayor of Austin, Mister mm-hmm. uh, uh, Steve Adler. Adler. Yeah. Yep. Mr. Adler, Steve Adler is in the scene and he's doing a ribbon cutting with me, the, um, the fire chief. And we have a, uh, a disturbance that, uh, requires shark boy and lava girl to show up. So they do. Uh Oh, and, uh, it's a really good scene. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be one of those that, uh, I think will stand out in the movie as people will recognize him. And of course, you know, he's, he's got that diverse, uh, like all politicians do. He's got a group that loves him sure. and, Large group of Austinites that that want to see him go. So there you have it. It'll be it'll be fun. It'll be fun in this movie. Yes, it will be a fun movie. It it will be a fun movie. All right. So now now that he's gone, we can really, really talk tell people what we think about him. Yeah. So let's talk about him. Mind his back. My goodness, that Carlton guy. He's a guy. What a poop head. Well, poop head. we believe he's a guy. Mm. <laughs> Uh, right. oh, oh, he's he's back. Shh. Oh, oh, oh. All right, stop, stop, stop talking. Okay. About him. Oh, okay. great. Oh, hey, 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 man. Yeah. Hey, it's good we to see you. Yeah, nothing yeah. bad about you hey. while you were gone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love this hotel Wi-Fi. It's so good. <laughs> it's great. It's yeah. it's actually creating quite the game for us to play because every time you go away, we just start talking bad about you. Yeah. And then when you're back, we're like, oh, oh hey, yeah. we love him. And then, right. and then you'll never right. know. I right. probably shouldn't have told. Just fill in the blank. Yeah. Fill in the blank. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. One 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 blank at a at a time. Yeah. Um. Right. Perfect. So so anyway, so the scene is the scene is like I said that large shark boy and lava girl show up to save the day and they just don't make it in time. Uh-huh. So bad things happen in our scene and and the mayor doesn't get his way. So like I said as diverse it is, is that he's got followers that love him and many people that want to see him go. The movie's going to please both of them. Perfect. <laughs> okay. yeah. right. So are you, are you, are you I can read between the lines there. Oh. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. I'm picking up what you're laying down. 
what you're putting down. <laughs> yeah. It's smoking what you're rolling. Smoking what you're rolling. Yeah. Slow your jets, yep. Gary. Slow your roll, mm. cool your jets. God, I am off tonight. My goodness. I am so sorry. My goodness. All right. <laughs> uh, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm so, I'm just. Movies so good, good, they're bad right there. Oh, <laughs> God. Podcasts right. so good, they're bad. <laughs> Do All we right. fall into that category? Mm, we're getting there. We're getting there quickly. Oh, oh we lost Carlton done. anyway, so that's fine. <laughs> This is just this is this is a, a great, great episode. episode. I'm such so, a shit show. <laughs> I'm so excited for this episode. Let me tell you. Hey, and it looks like we were just joined uh, by my friends, uh, LA-based producer Kapil Mahendra and Chicago-based filmmaker Matthew Strand Jordan. Gentlemen, so glad you could join us and welcome to the show. Well, I got to say, Johnny, I, I, I do like you as a person, but the reason I, I was excited about this particular topic is that you mentioned The American President. So I did. Which is my favorite film of all time. I know. I know you, uh, you're you a big fan of Sorkin, so we're going to definitely get into his work for yes. sure. Uh, so, so for our listeners, uh, since uh, Kapil, Matt, we've never had you guys on before, uh, we do want to go ahead and just get uh, kind of a little bit of a background on uh, the two of you guys, how long you've been in the industry, maybe what you've done. Feel free to plug what you're comfortable with. Um, so yeah, so Kapil, let's start with you. Um, so, I mean, we obviously know how we know each other, but, uh, the listeners, they're not familiar with you. So, so I've, I've been producing all kinds of shows, uh, for the last 20 years and Johnny and I met each other on the set of one of my shows back, uh, back in Dallas, Texas, a couple of months ago, ago and we hit it off well, and, uh, we're going to be producing, uh, some new shows together uh, come January. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. Well, happy to, very happy to have you on uh, on the episode. Uh, Matt, how about you? Um, I got my start in uh, about 2016 when, uh, lo and behold, I opened my college door and there was Angus T. Jones, who was Jake from Two and a Half Men. That's right. Are you telling me uh, and so when he was my college roommate, I kind of decided that the universe couldn't scream at me any louder. And so I decided to pursue a career in film and television. And so I, I like to see myself more as a writer, but, you know, I can do about anything on set if given the right chance to that's right a man of many talents love it renaissance man uh all right well i i specialize i specialize on set and waiting around for lunch okay that, that's, that's an important, important that is skill. an important job to have yeah uh it's a very unusual talent but an appreciated one and valuable right. yes i agree <laughs> Uh, so for this episode, uh, we're going to go on ahead, and as I was telling everybody, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, government and political films and TV shows, uh, if you guys uh, prefer as well. I'm sure we talked about Martin Sheen, West Wing will probably come up, and Aaron Sorkin at some point. Um, so let's just jump Let's jump in. Um, we did want to kind of start this episode off with discussing the, t- discussing the types of genres available for films uh, and television that focused on... Uh, elections, president, government in general, things like that. But as a bit of a sidebar, what about the other genres that kind of touch into politics? So uh, films about revolution, Mm -hmm. films about uh, major wars, um, maybe conflict going on within the military, um, even social injustice, things of that nature. Um, Let's open it up to the panel and we'll go with our guests first. Um, Do you guys consider those to be government or politically based films or is that something that's going to be more uh socially based and uh, a, a kind of a time of the times um and so carlton I, I did want to start with you on this one since we kind of made you wait around for a little bit um what do you think oh i have a lot of thoughts about i think it's perfect for 2020 especially talking about the election <laughs> Uh, well, we'll, we'll, we'll move on for the we'll time. We'll come being. back to that. Well, okay. Well, I, I said I'm career military myself, retired, and I spent some time in combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan. So movies of a war nature have a kind of a special spot with me. Um, sometimes they, they are difficult to watch because they are awful at portraying the military. And sometimes they're great to watch because they do a great job of portraying the military and the story that they're portraying. So um, it, it, it can be difficult to watch some of those sometimes when they when they really mess up the um, the culture or or the uniforms and all that. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So you're saying there's there's a lot of inaccuracies, um, no matter how you know minute they might be. Um, there, there, you see a fair amount typically in a lot of the ones that, are there any films in particular that you've seen and you're like, oh wow, that's not accurately depicted whatsoever. 
Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's not that it's just not accurately depicted. I, th- I think there's sometimes there's genres that they don't try to be. Mm-hmm. You know, like there's movies that they're not trying real hard to to get it right, mm-hmm. and that's okay. But the ones where they're trying to tell a story like Black Hawk Down, and those men are alive and they're with us, and they and they they they've recanted their mission. I think those are the ones where you you watch it and you go, I, I really like that they keep things. Um, true to the story and they also worked hard to keep the customs and the traditions uh that were um that and again even the uniforms were all in all in check sometimes like i said they they don't even try and it it makes it hard to to uh enjoy it as a military person but i know the film itself has has some relevance to culture i I, those kind of movies like a few good men or um you know something like that sure Okay, so for for you, yeah, would would you say that you would be able to classify any of the military, because it seems like you concentrated on the military aspect, would you be able to classify those as a political or government-based genre, or is that a genre all its own, or do you think it's a mixture of the two? I think it's a mixture of the two. I think, I think some of these, um, for example, like uh, Wag the Dog. Sure. I mean, that's, that's definitely a political-based military-style movie. Um, it has all political overtones to it um, as well. So I, I think there's a mixture of those two things. And a lot of times there are agendas in these movies, um, obviously, which it is, again, no problem with that. That's what movies are made for. Uh, make people think, make people wake up, make people have, have some, um, some uh, broadened, broadened thoughts. So, yeah, I think, I think there is a blending of that. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, Kapil, same question to you. Where, where do you feel that a lot of these fall? It depends on the picture, right? Sure. Each film, some will lean more on the political side, some will lean more on the social side, and oftentimes it's, just like Carlton said, a combination of the two. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad you brought up Wag the Dog. I was thinking about that film at the beginning of this, of this call, and, uh, you know, that's a very, very good example of exactly what we're talking about here. Yeah, exactly. A great, great film. Uh, Matt, what do, you, what do you think? Do you, are you in agreement? Do you think that it's it's just a, a combo of all of them, or do you think the military ones don't apply? Um, you know, it really depends on how much, in my opinion, how much financial backing the production's getting from the government or the, okay. uh, the U.S. military, mm-hmm. an example. Because, you know, if they're supplying, you know, mass amounts of people for big, you know, shots is making the military look more grand, it's going to have more of a positive... I mean, depending on how they allow the filmmaker to do it, more of a positive, like, pro-military message. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, something that's more critical, maybe you're not going to see as many service members or anything. You're not going to see, like, Humvees driving around because the military didn't like the script that they'd submitted. Right. So it kind of... it, it's a it's a delicate dance because you need to be realistic when you're making a project, but you also don't want to lose the artistic integrity behind it. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I know that I had, I had read... Um, I think the only one that I had read that had done that, it's funny you bring that up, um, the Mel Gibson We Were Soldiers, mm-hmm. uh, the Vietnam flick, I remember they had done that. Um, I guess, God, that was in 2000 or, or so, late 90s, whenever that was. Do you remember yeah, when? Yeah, it, it was sometime in the early 2000s, I believe, 2006, yeah. maybe. Yeah. That I mean, that brings up another point. Do you guys think that the government uh, or just politicians in general should be getting into and funding films? Like is that, is that okay, or does it create a does it create an you know an unfair bias because their major backer is is the U.S. government, or or are we okay with that? Panel, Gary, it looks like you're you're got something on the tip of your tongue there. Well, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I kind of normally fall into the camp of you know uh, it it should be its own sort of artistic endeavor, so it doesn't really need any government funding sure. to it, uh, and just let what what the uh, the the market will bear will bear and so if you yeah. make a movie that everybody wants to see like uh, I don't know a, a a war movie like Patton or something you know you'll probably bring in a lot of money but if uh, you make a more uh, a movie that's not quite as appealing maybe it'll be harder to make you know yeah absolutely Neil what about you I mean I don't think there's a problem with the government helping fund movies like you know you take down Periscope. I don't think anyone could say there's any political backing there. It's just <laughs> an entertaining movie that happens to be backed by, you know, the U.S. Navy. Was it? 
I would have to assume that most of those shots and the use of the submarines and the naval forces were had to have had some kind of backing. I mean, how much can a 40-year-old diesel sub from the communist, you know, block cost, you know? Well, they had, they had uh, I mean, hell, it's a horrible example, but uh, Pawn Stars, I was watching that a couple years ago, and they were at a, one of those army old, one of those old army bases where you could drive the tanks and go blow up stuff and they were offering one of the world war ii shermans for like 1.5 so yeah, okay, I mean, yeah. that's so, pretty expensive like i'm assuming a, a submarine might be would probably go for more than that i have no idea how much yeah, a submarine i don't know it's just for. a guess i don't, yeah. I don't know uh, who knows so so even even going so going yeah i think we can all agree that yeah I, i'd say that those those fall in under the political and government genre and there's as as we've talked about in every episode when it we talk about whatever sci-fi fantasy drama horror there's so many mixing of the genres at right, this point yeah. it, it it you can't even really classify them as just one specific genre anymore um but what about I, i'm curious about this what about revolution films uh v for vendetta les miserables um any anything like that whatever do you guys consider that to fall under that is that more under the political genre or is that more under um social injustice social construct genre i i think it's hard to sort of delineate between the two because uh politics you know is culture you know is mm-hmm. downstream of culture so it's hard to uh, I think separate those off in maybe their own distinct uh, genres um, would would be how I would say it. So, uh, like a movie V for Vendetta, um, it certainly speaks a lot about social issues, but uh, it's also it also does it a lot from a political standpoint. Sure. Whereas um, a movie like you know uh, Star Wars: The Phantom Menace has a lot of political intrigue in it, but it's not really like uh, talking about like real you know social situations yeah um any anybody else on that one i i don't want to go down the entire row if nobody gives a crap um it's it's, (laughs) i don't give a flick johnny i don't i don't give a flick (laughs) yeah i can't even plug my own show jesus that was a marathon what am i doing up here get this mic out out in front of me take it away (laughs) um okay anywho um so uh, going going from that, I mean, we when you look at when you look at the films based off um, when you look at films based off revolution or uh, uh, a people fighting for their independence, whatever um, is are those political films those types of films are those more important to the masses to the people uh, themselves? Uh, does it? Do you guys think it it gives a voice to those that? the news outlets didn't initially target and they didn't give them the opportunity nowadays with, with social media going on, obviously everybody with a phone is a, is a fucking journalist. Everybody with a phone is a reporter or commentator on anything. Um, but 20 years ago, 70 years ago, whatever, a lot of these films that came out, um, they were developed from newspaper articles or books that were, that were dug up by journalists or they were, you know, somebody, spoke out and they talked to enough people where, uh, you know, somebody important enough took notice. Do you, how important do you guys think those type of films are to, um, the fabric of society as a whole? You know, how, how important is that? Um, is it, is important to tell that story through film or is it not fair to tell that story through film because it might be biased because it's only coming from one viewpoint typically? Well, I, I think it was 1976 when the movie Network came out. Um, oh yeah, great movie. Yeah, and uh, I, you know I think that was a a really interesting film for the you know what my understanding of the you know mid seventies was. Mm-hmm. But I, I think if you were to watch that film today, it would be even insanely more relevant to you know kind of the things that are happening today. So I, I think that uh, having you know uh, being able to tell a story uh, like that, you can also look at. Um, uh, All the President's Men, which was another, you know, mid-70s Absolutely. movie. Absolutely, yeah. Um, with, about, which was about uh, Watergate and the Nixon scandal, um, you know, and kind of just summing up a a complicated large scenario into, uh, you know, a two-and-a-half-hour movie. So, I mean, I agree. I, I think, you know, like you said, giving voice to, to people who didn't have a voice at the time. If you look at, like, Hotel Rwanda, yeah. I don't think a lot of people in that time knew what was going on. But, yeah. you know. Mm-hmm. The film, as far as I could tell, did a good job of, of documenting right. you know, the incident. Exactly. 
yeah, all the genocide going on. Uh, and and, and, and that, that's a good point, too, because, um, like, you know, as you, as you said, as far as you can tell, did a good job of documenting. So in, you know, 50 or 60 years, whatever happened in Rwanda in real life is not going to be as um, remembered as, say, the movie that... Uh, the you know Hotel Rwanda, so that's going to be what future generations kind of take away from the incident. Sure, absolutely. Um, Carlson, where are you at on that one? Yeah, I, I agree, I, and I think I think that's why movies can be so powerful with with educating and with enlightening and bringing uh, us a um, bringing again uh, to light maybe something that that um, even even in our own world we didn't even know about. I I, I did a, a movie a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Gary Ross directed it was called um the free state of Jones yeah. and um mm-hmm. and and uh, I had a great time on that set because they they took the cast they took us all down to um Mississippi before we started shooting and they gave us a tour of the places historically that this movie is about it was written by a college professor at Texas State University in San Marcos her name is uh, Vicky Bynum and so she did the research for this book, and and of course it was turned into a movie. And and um, the idea that a man f- fought for the for the South first because that's where he lived, and then he changed and fought for the North because he saw the South being corrupt, and then he started his own free state and and made his own uh, sovereign country. Well, I'd never heard the story before. Yeah. So to be in a to to read it for the first time in script and then to go to that part of the country where that's a known story and the movie opens up in the 1950s because they were still having trials about his kids whether they should go to a black or white school because if they have a drop of black blood and they go to a white school they've integrated the schools in the south and right. that trial they open up on um in the movie is in the 1950s mm-hmm. you know so I think the movie has relevance because here we are now when we're, we, we're, we're resolved the issue of, of desegregating the schools and mm-hmm. all that. But we haven't resolved the issue of race relations. And so the movie has this kind of a, a, a new feel to it, a new understanding about where that came from. And again, the story of Newt Knight, I had never heard of in all of my years of, of education. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um, Kapil, Matt, where are you guys at with that? So, uh, in a related topic, my favorite example mm-hmm. that brings all of this together in its own way is Forrest Gump. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it touches on multiple genres of film, multiple historical events, including Watergate, which was men- mentioned earlier and you talked about Nixon and Frost Nixon. Have you guys seen that oh, one? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Frank Langella and Michael Sheen. Hell yeah. All I remember about that film is cheeseburgers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, product placement right there. Of course, I don't know what restaurant the cheeseburgers were from. It was actually from. a reference to the film, but anyway. <laughs> it, was, it was the exact line. I meant in the film. Uh, <laughs> Matt? Yeah, that too. That too. Um, but yeah, I, I, uh, I, I feel you guys talked earlier about you know, is it okay for a government or organization or agency to back a film? Right. I say, why not? I mean, we still believe in freedom here in this great country. And why can't any group make any type of film they like? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th- I think that's that's the biggest thing, especially when you look at, uh, just to sidebar a little bit, it's relevant, um, to go off with the state funding, you know, for tax incentives for um, for large productions and stuff. I know the state of Texas, we had uh, from like 2000 to 2010, we had almost $100 million a year um, dedicated or excuse me, allocated for uh, large film companies to come out here and and shoot. And, you know, if you shot over a certain budget and you took uh, a certain amount of money from that budget and allocated it to local services rendered, uh, whether it be hotels or mom and pop restaurants, whatever, uh, then you'd get a big tax break on it. And it encouraged Hollywood to come out here and funnel more money into our economy, and it strengthened Central mm-hmm. Texas. It strengthened the entire state. Um, and now they they cut that a while back, and just recently brought it back up to about fifty million. So we lost a lot of jobs to Atlanta because um, Georgia, uh, you know, they they went up with that. Yeah. But I agree. No, yeah. I, I totally agree with you, Kapil. I, I think that it's 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 paramount 
honestly, for moving moving the money away from just L.A., just New York, and moving it into other cities uh, around the country and giving other people uh, plenty of opportunities to actually get into that field. Um, you know, and I mean, take take a lot of us, for example, out of everybody on this podcast, you're the only one from California. You know, Matt's from Chicago, and the uh, the rest of us are all, you know, from I, the Austin area. I am too. from California, right. and, and even though it's very expensive to do business in California, sure. I still operate 11 corporations out of the state of California because it's my home state sure. and I believe in paying my fair share of taxes in my home state. But at the same time, I have a, a TV series that's going to start being filmed in Atlanta right. in February. Mm -hmm. And we opened uh, Calabasas Films opened officially an office in Franklin, Tennessee last Monday. That's right. Uh, Congrats. The tax as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. But, but so it's nice. I, I like that I can do both things when I can keep my operations in my home state of California and pay through the nose and taxes, <laughs> but do it proudly because that's what everybody pays to do business in our wonderful state of California. I'm making a show called California filming, filming in a couple of that's weeks. That's right. Uh, Being filmed but in I Atlanta. also like to take advantage of tax. <laughs> yep. Yep. And I, I like the tax credits in Atlanta and in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And, but the tax credits are nice, but we go out to these different areas to be in different parts of the country and to be with, with the people in those regions uh, and really have bring bring the local culture to the forefront, which is what I enjoy the most. Okay, so what would everyone say makes a uh, a good political drama? What are some of the elements that we find like are most appealing? Um, you know, whether it be a, a war political drama or a, you know, like a, a, a election like election drama, drama, anything yeah. like that. What what are some of the key ingredients that for y'all personally, you need to have in order to be like, that was a really good, uh, you know, political drama movie. I, I like to start with a very uh, big political historical event that most of the country would be familiar with. Mm -hmm. And then you bring into that some humor, some comedy, a little bit of love, a little bit of romance, a little bit of drama. Uh, and you get into those intense moments mm -hmm of tension, uh, again, with uh, followed by some comedic, comedic relief, uh, and then hopefully with a nice feel good, happy ending. Absolutely. For, for me, I think it, for me, I think it's really more about subtlety because, uh, you know, anyone can just sit there and shove information into your face, but you know, if you're take, if you're making people take a step back and just presenting them with something and letting them draw their own conclusions, I think those are the movies that really stay with us. Because, you know, like um, this isn't a political movie, but is the top spinning at the end of Inception? You know, that right. was the hot topic when it came out is is starting that kind of conversation. I think those are the movies that last more culturally and impactfully in, in a political spectrum. You know, I mean, brought up Hotel Rwanda that brought somewhat of a spotlight onto the issue. And it, you know, maybe didn't solve the issue, but it definitely put more hands on trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's and that's that's great that you guys had that, that you brought that up because that actually just ties back in to the last topic itself, you know, bringing up these and Kapil, to your point, bringing up these large political events that may not have necessarily been highlighted by the mass media at the time. You bring up the smaller ones. So it gives those people a voice no matter what side they're on. You know, uh, it doesn't matter, um, gives them that voice and it brings light to the injustices that they faced, whatever it may be. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that for me. I also really love to have a lot of I love to have a lot of background. Honestly, I, I love to have it doesn't have, even have to be flashbacks. It can be, you know, it can be a couple paragraphs like Star Wars at the beginning. Mm -hmm. I prefer it not to be. But I do appreciate that. You know, I like to have history behind the characters so I can find them to be more relatable. And uh, I like them to be humanized early on. So I find something to hold on to and I'm rooting for them to the end. Um but I guess that kind of goes with with every story for a film. <laughs> OK. All right. uh, Neil, what about you? I mean, I think for a good political drama, you have to have some form of corruption. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, elected officials ideally are supposed to represent the population and they're supposed to be the best person elected by the people to represent them. But obviously, you know, it's going to come down to corruption. And that's, I think, one of the big motivators that makes a, a good political movie. Absolutely. Carlton? I, yeah, I agree, and I and I think I think again that personal story, something that we ha maybe from a, a viewpoint or someone's eyes that we didn't even know existed, you know, I, 
one of my uh, favorite uh, presidential movies is not about a president at all. Hmm. It's about a butler. I love the butler. Lee Daniels. Oh, yeah. Lee Daniels, the butler. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Good pick. You know, that that movie tells a story, a true story, through the eyes of a man that, that served in the White House. And, um, you know, he did his job. And, and you could see what that looked like, him going home at night. And, you know, and to see the, even in that movie, to see the people that that read that and said, I'll do it. Like, you know, uh, Oprah Winfrey's in that and, mm-hmm. and, and Whitaker's and, you know, but. That that movie is one of those where I think I think that has the elements that I look for. And that's I know that this happened or maybe I didn't. But I also don't know what his exact viewpoint was, what his eyes saw and what he did. And I thought that movie took us into the White House and and showed us the life of of an African-American um, family and the and that and what it was like to serve and, and to be and to be in that in his shoes. And that that to me was touching. So what's interesting is it seems like everyone, um, whether you whether or not you like a you know a more subtle story or a more um, you know action packed story or a more uh, one filled with corruption, it seems like the panel and you know all agree that they like a story based on real events or maybe a melodramatic version of something that may have happened rather than fictitious. Am I hearing that correctly? For politically motivated films, I'd yeah. say personally, for me, yeah. Okay. I'd say it's accurate. Yeah, for political films, yes. Okay. That, okay, that, that, yeah. that's, that's kind you, of interesting. You yeah. couldn't really do that in every genre, so. No, yeah. For this I mean, one in particular. Yeah, because <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it's kind of the, the first genre we've really touched on where you could have historically accurate or yeah. uh, related movies. Yeah, um, and it's funny, you know, out of pretty much everything we've brought up, I think uh, to my not, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think V for Vendetta was the only fictitious story so far. So far, yeah, so far. Well, so, ooh, well, ooh. well okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you another one. I enjoy the movie My Fellow Americans. That's a ah, great movie. Yeah, it's a good movie. That film, you know, I love that film. James Garner and Jack Lemmon, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you've got big fighter power there, and I mean, I think it's hilarious. I mean, I laughed. Uh, acting through it, I thought it was, <laughs> you know, again, <laughs> don't forget one of Wilford those Brimley. where it took something that we all know or we assume we know with with, with pop culture, you know, what goes on and, and all that. But it it made it it made it fun to watch. And these two uh, seasoned actors really came across as presidential. If there's a if there's such a thing, um, and I thought that was a great movie. I, I still enjoy watching that movie. I uh, to, to wrap this section up, uh, I d- I did want to ask. Uh, Current, do you guys consider, and this can be a one word answer on this one from everybody, um, do we consider Hollywood to be, God, at the time, do we consider Hollywood to be more of uh, the 1940s through mid 2000s version of social media? Like, we didn't have it before then. You know, that was the only way for, it seems like, to me at least, from all the information we've gathered over the years and this conversation, that that was the only way for people that didn't have a voice to reach out and say something, to actually have their story told. Because the news outlets, from the papers to all the, you know, ABC, Fox, whatever, um, it didn't seem like they were, they obviously couldn't touch on every story. So do you guys feel like that's that's accurate, or or am I a little off? Am I crazy? I'll say, I'll say maybe, uh, probably yes. Like, obviously I read about World War II and the Holocaust, but watching Schindler's List Mm -hmm. is definitely, you know. Oh, yeah. Being able to see the drama as opposed to just reading facts. Yeah. It's way more profound and impactful for sure. Yeah. Watching, I mean, watching Jacob the Liar and you, you actually get to see the everyday life and routine of these people during being in the internment camps or concentration camps. Um, it's, it's just, yeah, it, it's eye opening for sure. Uh, Gary looked like you, I mean, like I, there was not social media beforehand, but I mean, you know, people like actually communicated with other people in terms of like, you know, they would, you know, mm-hmm. go out and, you know, talk with their friends or, you know, write letters to the editor for newspapers. Um, but you, could, you had talk mm-hmm. radio shows. I mean, I, I really wouldn't say that 
Hollywood was the one and only outlet for that. Okay. I, I think that's a, a, a view that's too limited. But to, well, I, okay, I respectfully would have to disagree and ask you, but as far as the mass scale, like, mm-hmm. I mean, think about, I mean, so you're talking about people talk to their friends and you're talking about, you know, the ripple effect where, you know, you chat with one person or you act a certain way and it affects three people and sure. then they affect three people and so forth. Um, so... You don't think that if a story gets told and it's shown on every major theater across the country mm-hmm. that it's going to see and affect more people than as opposed to if you do a talk show interview and well, maybe reaches one city or maybe like five syndicated cities after that? Or? Uh, it's not only like talk shows. I mean, like, you know, uh, especially in the United States, uh, you know, books and pamphlets have been, you know, played a major role like you have, you know. Thomas Paine's Common Sense. It was more well, sure, more but they didn't have Hollywood the, back in the 1700s, <laughs> right? Okay, so, but like uh, you know, you, you've got a lot of uh, um, like you know. I think To Kill a Mockingbird, the the book mm-hmm. was probably more influential than the movie. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess. Yeah. If we're yeah, we go the literature route. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Matt. What about you? You know, I'm kind of torn on the answer because I would say I like my gut instinct is to say yes, just because it was such a revolutionary format for people to consume information because it's way easier to make someone sit there for an hour and a half than to have them sit there and read an entire book. Mm-hmm. That Even though you are missing some of the parts of the book, you're still getting basic, basically the same summary in the movie. But, you know, I think it's kind of changed it as time has passed on because – you know, I think now that there's so much video, people are kind of just like, ugh, they're kind of tired of it. As back then, it was way more concentrated, so I feel like the message would hit home more. But now it's like, oh, you know, I'm scrolling through Instagram and I'll come across, you know, 10 videos of something negative, And it's like, you know, I just don't even want to look at it anymore. Yeah, I mean, the attention spans, as you're saying, they're just they're so much shorter nowadays. Mm-hmm. What are you going to do? Uh, Kapil, what do you think? Uh, I agree with the original statement. I say yes. For sure. Uh, Before there was social media, the only way to make these stories and incidents known uh, throughout the country and around the world was through television and film. There was absolutely no other way uh, except for radio. But in the time period you pointed out, the 1940s to 2000s, you know, a very small portion of that was radio and it was mostly film. Uh, And when you listen to the radio uh, in, in that time frame, uh, the radio was talking about what was playing in the films. Right. So it all circles back to film uh, and telling stories uh, and that being the only voice and uh, and the ancient version of social media. Absolutely. Carlton? Yeah, and I think, I think again, it was, it was so controlled as well, you know. Um, you wouldn't have had the story of a minority family in the paper uh, and what they were, what their struggle was on their side of the town, or or you wouldn't have heard the story of possibly some unrest in a community um, that the press and the and the government uh, would have agreed that, that wasn't worth putting in into. And now with a camera everywhere and everyone with their with their ability to write their own story, I mean, <clears throat> we have just been inundated with these great stories of of my grandmother did this or my grandfather used to do this and nobody would have known. Um, it, it left up to the uh, controlled media of the forties through what, and even on the radio, you know, it, it's controlled. And, and you look at the, at the actors of the day, um, you know, in, until Sidney Poitier and a few others broke the ceiling. I mean, there was, uh, you know, definitely a, uh, a, a racial bias there as well, not only with the movies, sure. but with the um, with the actors who portrayed them. I know he brought up Sidney Poitier and Breaking Barriers, and I've had the pleasure and honor of working with Sidney multiple times over the last 15 years. That's right. Uh, and to sure. hear from him firsthand what he went through in those days to break those barriers was truly breathtaking. God, did, did by any chance, did he did he ever give you a specific story at all? Oh, so many, but... Uh, okay, gotcha. Uh, they're personal. Uh, those yeah. are more conversation over a beer. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. not not on. No food. problem. <laughs> but I, but I think word. I think that that's my point. I think what you said is that's my point. That that again, if we had him today, and we gave him an iPhone, and we said, you know, make a movie, not not a studio, you know, not the MGM and 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 Paramount and all these people that own these actors under contract that make you know these 
these George Burns types and Errol Flynn and all those of the day that, hey, you're guaranteed a movie. You, you, you have him today, that great actor who could portray anything, and you give him an iPhone and say, make a movie <laughs> or tell a story <laughs> yeah. of your community. I mean, it, it breaks down all those barriers, and it, it's going to be it, – it is, it is revolutionary what we're able to do right now. True. I mean, can you mm-hmm. can you imagine the mm-hmm. TikToks that those guys could have made? Think about it. It would have been terrible. <laughs> not- it would have been awful. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably, probably not enough uh, not enough time on the video to show to show everything on what's really happening. Um, so, Carlton, to to segue off your point that was going into the next uh, section, anyways, and this is a section primarily for you. Um, when portraying these actors, when you and I had talked, you had you had told me that in a couple of different indie films, and I I, I, I and in a couple was it a, was it just any films that you portrayed politicians or did you do in commercials as well or how did that work no i've done i've done in films i've played um politicians before gotcha. yes. yeah. so you said you had uh, been a senator and you had also gotten to play the president as well um so cap I, I i did have to ask this portion capturing the essence of of a a role that has such power and you know, the, the magnitude of, of the responsibility that comes with, with that position. How do you, how do you, how do you get into character for something like that? I, I don't know if you're a technical or a method actor. I have no clue. Um, so maybe if you're technical, you just walk right into it and, and that's that, you know, be professional, you know, I'll get the be hell out of here. Actor. I got yeah. You. Okay. You can go suck the Olivier cock. Okay. Um, geez, <laughs> uh, how, so, so anger. how do you, uh, Oh, but, Guy Matt, believe me, Gary and I have known each other since high school, so it's 15 years of since going back and school, forth. Actually, Johnny, oh god, it's oh, been, so he deserves it's been 20, it. That's all. Oh, you he say. deserves it so he deserves it so hard. Um, but it's been 20 years of arguing between the the technical and yep. and method. Yep, 20 years, 20 fucking years. Anywho, um, that's a that's another conversation for another day. But uh, yeah, so Carlton, what what do you do typically to get into uh, that type of role? Are you do you consider yourself a method or a technical actor, or are you integrated? Or well, I'm uh, yeah, I'm I'm more of a technical, but okay. I would say there. I mean, I definitely have a have a method um, that it, it, at times is needed. But what I what I would say to that is, if it's a real person, then I then I do, I do study the person. I want to see what they're like, and I I do what I can. And in some cases, I've actually got to meet the person I'm portraying. I've actually played people really? that I've actually got to go and sit down with and have have a you know a conversation with. But if it's someone that's that's fictitious and it's me able to to kind of bring to life off the page somebody that's never been heard of, mm-hmm. never been seen before, um, then I base it off of just some people that I think were really good politicians. And I know that when I did the presidency that was not based off a real person, it was a, a fictitious name and they'd never been president. Uh-huh. I based it a lot off of uh, LBJ because okay. I think his larger than life persona – and again, I was a Texan president, so I think I, I, I found myself leaning in towards watching his uh, videos and his, um, his speeches and his patterns because um, he's one of those that has a very powerful presence in the room, and he's got that almost that bully personality. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you've seen pictures of him where he's leaning in, talking to somebody really close to them and towering over them uh, to give his opinion. So, um, yeah, if, if, I, if I don't have a real person to go off of and that's not a real person I'm portraying, mm-hmm. then, then my method is to find somebody who I can really emulate that people will automatically say, that's a president or that's a senator. Right. Now, and, and, and I'm, I am familiar with uh, conversations we've had in the past on a couple of other roles that you've played. Is it more difficult for you to get into the mindset of a politician or is it more difficult to get into the mindset of, let's say, the antagonist, like maybe a villain of some kind or uh, even a police chief or something? I know you had you had just been a police officer in a recent film. Um, what What's harder for you? Well, it's harder for, for me. I guess the hardest thing for me is is the bad guy. Okay. Um, you know, I'm 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 an I'm a guy that naturally smiles. I <laughs> like to smile a lot. I like I I cut up a lot, and um, that taking that personality, me, and removing it completely, and being, you know, the 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 uh, you know the furrowed brow and the and the and the skull on my face and all of that. It's it's harder for me to stay in that character 
But what I like about it is that once I grow into that character, I, I last year in, in a movie called, uh, or sorry, uh, Apostolic, uh, I think it's going to be on YouTube, but it was called Blood Order. Mm -hmm. And I play the uh, lead bad guy, a German Nazi the bad guy. Um, after a couple of days on set, I'm I'm in. I'm I'm I've bought into the you know I drank the Kool Aid. I'm ready to go, <laughs> and it's hard because I don't like being that person in real life. So once I get there, I I have a hard time turning that back off. I like that we shot several days in a row, and I like that we had those those real rough scenes where I'm, you know, pushing people around and shooting people and all that <laughs> because. To me, it's like I go there. I really get in there and go there. But that's the hardest part. I rather, I'd rather play the nice guy. Sure. But I say that knowing that um, playing the bad guy really gives me a better range of my acting. Absolutely. Uh, so, so this, so this going out to everybody else as well. And I open this to the panel. Um, for the, for me personally, whenever I think of particular roles i'm i'm i was up until a couple years ago i guess but i was really big into the oscars that was like my version of the film super bowl you know uh film championships whatever um so whenever i was hearing stuff online about different actors who were looking to grab that first oscar nod um your gary oldman's Leonardo your johnny Depp's, DiCaprio. Your, your Leonardo DiCaprio's exactly um a lot of times the stories that come up for their newest film, there's always some type of paragraph about how they haven't reached that upper echelon of all time greats because they haven't won the Oscar. And they're always looking for a specific type of role, a specific type of script. Um, the one that will just, it'll just give them that, that Oscar nod. Um, so I'm typically, whenever I think about this particular question, um, I think about different sects or genres of, uh, or excuse me, not genres, classes or types of um, characters, I guess. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think, now that I'm done with my tangent, what do you guys think the, do you think that playing a politician is the most memorable role that an actor or actress can take or uh, even a world leader and that that can include that can include dictator it can include um sar or king or queen or whatever do you guys think those types of roles are the most memorable for you or do you think it's the villain do you think it's uh the leading man or lady that's i don't know they have some major disease you know they're just an everyday average joe or is it the uh the people that, you know, that portray William Wallace or that portray Richard Nixon or or whatever mm -hmm. um, are those ones that are the most memorable to you? Are those the ones that impact you the most and always hit home for you? Um, Gary, let's start with you. I mean, I, I don't I don't think it matters the origin of the role, in my opinion. Um, I think it just matters how the actor or, or actress approaches the role. I, I, I think, for example, of. Anthony Hopkins in Silence of the Lambs. He's okay. only on screen for I think Silence around Lambs. you know nineteen minutes or so. Absolutely, but um, like it, it, he's what you think of when you think of Silence of the Lambs. Like sure. that is an like I, I think a real strong uh, performance by a strong actor. Whereas you know you could have um, him in another movie like uh, Thor, okay. where you it know it's Odin the same and, actor, right. um, a little bit older, but like. Uh, a much less impactful role. So would you, would you say that? So would you? So would you say that the villain class, the villain type, is the one that typically is the most memorable for you that hits home the most because you know you've still got you've got a Heath Ledger's performances. I don't know the Joker mm -hmm. in Dark Knight. You've got Javier Bardem from No Country for Old Men. Um, I, I is, mean, is it that is it that class that I always enjoyed playing the the antagonist the most when I. Uh, when I did acting. Um, but I, I think that the villain as the villain, you get to explore parts of humanity, uh, that you don't necessarily get to do as the protagonist in sure. a lot of ways. Um, cause usually the antagonists are in one way or another giving in, um, like they don't resist their right. baser instincts. Whereas the hero, you know, will. So it's easier to leave a lasting impact on the memory of the audience. If you're playing a villain. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that, yeah, I, I think that okay. you typically do remember the villains. Like in Bram Stoker's Dracula, you remember sure. Gary Oldman. Not, 
I do. I but you also remember. remember him as Winston Churchill in in Darkest Hour as well. Yes, but Gary so, Oldman's maybe amazing. That's, that, that's true. I that was I just watched that the other day for like the third time, and it just was fresh in my memory. Um, we so will fight him on the air. <laughs> fight him in the beaches. Yes. <laughs> uh, Kapil, what about you? Uh, you know, I don't have too many thoughts on the, on this topic. Okay. All right. For, Mo- moving on. That's okay. For Matt. For me, for me, I I mean, I think it's definitely easier to remember the villains just because, like you okay. were saying earlier, it's a part of humanity that we don't often look at ourselves because, you know, we I mean, if you're a sane person, you don't go around thinking about shooting people. But, you know, <laughs> Heath Ledger had to get in that mindset. I mean, hell, Heath Ledger lost his mind trying to get into the lost character. Lost his life. Joker. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, he lost his life and his mind. And I mean, I don't know. I think it's. We, because there's good in every bad guy, and I think that's what separates the great performances from the, you know, just the memorable, like the great performances from the ones that, you know, they're good, but that you don't, they don't stand out to you. Sure. Because if you can bring that touch of humanity to make the villain human, even if he is killing someone, then it it really it just adds and makes it that Oscar win. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, Neil, what about you? Uh, for me, I don't think I don't think there's really like a um one one uh, particular role that stands out like villains or whatnot i think it's watching an actor step out of his comfort zone like you think of bill murray and you think he's a comedian mm-hmm. but he also i'm pretty sure was reaching for an oscar when he tried to be uh, fdr uh and <laughs> to me it's a very forgettable right. role uh, so i don't think like i don't think i can say like villains or presidents, people like that stand out to me. It's more just watching an actor step out of his comfort comfort zone. Okay, Carlton, how about you? Yeah, I'm I'm kind of torn too. But I think I think as I think back to the Oscar winners for best um, actor and best actress. I think overall, it's the ones that that bring the character to some form of like you said a minute ago, there's good and bad and bad and good, the, the yin and yang, but there's something about bringing the character to the personal level of the viewer. Right. So whereas we had the Joker win, we also had like um, the King's speech, which right. he's, you know, Colin he first, shows yeah. a flaw mm-hmm. and he has this great way of, um, you know, Colin does a great job of, of bringing that character to where people can go. He was the King but we can relate for some reason to this guy. We all have that insecurity. We all have some some flaw. Or Dallas Buyers Club when when uh, when they both won. When Leto and and Matthew both got mm-hmm. it for that one. Um, the the Oscar and supporting and and lead. I think people just related something about those characters. Yeah, they're strong and they're way out of their comfort zone. We obviously you know saw how far they got into character, the losing all that weight and everything. But there's something about that relatability, they they connected with an audience and they were vulnerable and they were weak and they were not, you know, here's a cowboy from Dallas, Texas, but he really, you know, has a soft spot. There's there's a there's a there's a, a flaw in him. He's got a disease and he's got a friend that's that's not a normal, uh, you know, considered friend to a cowboy. And, sure. you know, I think all of that makes up for um, an Oscar winning winning actor, even though it may not be. Um, the bad guy. Yeah. And, and for me, as I was saying with, with the villains earlier, and it, I definitely would agree with, with both you guys, it's definitely the role that causes the actor to step out of their, their shell, their, their normal go-to role. Every, a lot of actors are typecast and that's just how it is until they, they find that the, the role that leads them to a bigger payday or whatever, mm-hmm. or bigger hardware. Um, but I think with the villain role, even though it it's easier in the villain role to become memorable, because as you said, Matt, it's it's that exact same thing. You know, most people can't relate to that role, so they're going to remember it because it's it comes across as more interesting for sure. For me personally, the ones that I always love and the ones that I always remember are actually those politician roles, which is why I brought up the question originally. And and I'm going to bring up um, Martin Sheen as President Josiah Bar- as, as President uh, Bartlett from West Wing, and I know that's I know it's television, but it's just I mean it's just such an amazing fucking series. Anything Sorkin does, um, but what was cool is when they did the American President, 
Sorkin loved the way that Sheen delivered the dialogue and he he under he understood how to deliver it on like the first take. And so it was like something like I think you were maybe you're watching that documentary with me on it, yeah. but it was like a weekend or something. And Sorkin was in the it was uh, one of those classes that uh, it was the master, master class. Yeah, That's right. It was the master class. class. That's right. And he was he was like, yeah, it was a weekend. He's like, he's like, I, I knew who was going to play the president in my series. Like I, I had to have Martin Sheen. There was just nobody else that could fill the role. And even though I love Walter White and, you know, I love the the I love the Anthony Hopkins and the Heath Ledgers and all that. Um, it's it's those roles. It's it's the role of the president or a world leader. Um, you know, I, I say that with Mel Gibson and Braveheart. I know it wasn't political as a warrior, but same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, Frank Langella as Nixon. Um, you know, I those roles to me still when I think mm-hmm. of great performances that I'm like, I want to go back to watch that fucking movie mm-hmm. because that performance was so breathtaking and it was it just it turned my head so much more than what I would be think to be considered the easy way out, which is which is being that villain. OK, okay. Um, Anywho, so yeah, so so we're 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 getting close to the end here, and I'm sure everybody's getting tired. This is definitely one of our later ones. Um, I do want to move in here. Uh, we we do want to do Gary's new segment at the end, but uh, kind of wrap it up here. I did want to go around and uh, kind of wanted to get uh, recommendations and suggestions early from everybody on uh, their favorite um, either political television shows or favorite political films as well, um, and what their recommendations would be for our audience on maybe what to check out this week uh, it can be a famous movie it can be a non-famous one uh, it's totally up to you i think a great one right now for for today's climate uh, came out uh, it, it was nominated for an oscar this last uh, academy awards mm-hmm. uh as a documentary short called saint louis superman for me uh just an older one going back to the whole military that we started on talking about mm-hmm. i think a great movie that's a little bit older than many people have seen is paths of glory it's nice. a Stanley Kubrick movie, yep. so you know it's going to look nice, but it's one of those. It does a great job of showing the humanity of the people and just, you know, it's 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 not an us versus them. It's an it's just we. Right. And it's kind of taking the step back and looking at that. So I'd recommend it. Absolutely. Uh, Carlton, how about you? Uh, Milk. Milk nice. is one of my favorite films, mm-hmm. and I think um it's always good to watch it for its uh, any political climate, any political year. But you know, uh, Harvey Milk's story being taught by being, being uh, acted or portrayed by Sean Penn, and of course he won the Oscar for that as well. So um, well deserved and well well awarded. But I think the film um, is always timeless to go back and look at. Not very long ago, even in the eighties, um, someone was characterized as um, abnormal and was deviant for their sexual orientation and not allowed to teach in some states mm-hmm. and that uh, a man that stood up for those rights um, you know all, all ultimately lost his life was assassinated um, again not a presidential movie but uh, political, no, so political nevertheless and um, I got to meet the uh, screenplay writer Dustin uh, Lance Black mm-hmm. he just wrote a book last year and he did a book tour and I got to spend a few minutes with him and um, just to get it, it just the movie touches me. I just gotta say that just, it's a wonderful, wonderful film. Absolutely. Uh, and we'll, we'll go with Neil. So Gary doesn't steal his pick. Uh, yes, Neil, go thank ahead. you. Thank you. Well, I don't know if Gary would steal this one, but <laughs> this is an year. It is the presidential election, but it's also important to remember there are local elections. Uh, so a good movie that I would recommend if you haven't seen it is black sheep starring Chris Farley. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> one of his best and Prob- also one of his probably only probably my favorite political movie <laughs> <laughs> love it love it Gary uh, well uh, of, of course probably the seminal political movie is um, either Citizen Kane or uh, my recommendation uh, which is Mr. Smith Goes to Washington oh, it's 1939 yes. uh, uh, Frank Capra he's a um, bitch and uh, <laughs> if you haven't seen it uh, it's a fantastic movie um and I really, it, it's really a great movie. Um, I, I think especially in uh, sort of these times because it talks about um, you know just a, a regular Joe who's sent to Congress to to fill a senator seat, um, and uh, you know he's an honest guy. You know he runs a Boy Scout troop, um, and you know he kind of encounters this corruption. Um, 
played by a, the senior senator from his state and um, just tries to uh, to survive it. And uh, it, it's really worth watching just to get to the last scene when he's filibustering. Um, it's it's a very powerful scene. Uh, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Claude Rains, uh, gr- great performances. Johnny, did Gary steal your pick? No, no, Gary didn't steal my pick at all. I got a couple. Oh, it sounded like people. he did. No, 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 he did. He, okay. He's looking at me right now, laughing. I, you know, I really thought you were going to go 1776. I do love. What was the name of the guy that uh, Mr. Feeney's uh, the actor? Oh God, what was his name again? Uh, John Adams. Not John, okay, you're Mr. Right, Feeney. <laughs> I don't know his real name. <laughs> John Feeney. <laughs> yeah, John Feeney Adams. <laughs> Mr. Adams. Uh, no, no, it, it's cool. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that was actually when I was a kid. That's how I learned what a filibuster was. Was mm-hmm. just from watching that. Um, no, uh, my so I did have a backup. Did come with one. Um, election. Uh, the '99 Alexander first movie I actually had seen that Alexander Payne had done um, where uh, Reese Witherspoon is running a high school campaign for class president and uh, her largest adversary is not the actual opponent running against her. It is one of the teachers at the school, Matthew Broderick. Um, Matthew Broderick. Matthew Matthew Broderick. Um, It's just, it's just a fantastic look at, I, I know it's, it's high school politics, but it's eerily similar to a lot of if you, if you go back and read a lot of the interviews, it's eerily similar to uh, a lot of politicians stating, look, this is actually what happens to us on the campaign trail, like in actual national elections. They just happen to change the scene that it's located in and mm-hmm. moved it to a high school. So one of my favorites. Um, anyway, so fantastic picks from everybody. Um, really quick before we get off, uh, Gary has a new segment that he wanted to try out this week. Uh, just a fun little Fun little game that he had going on. Uh, so, Gary, why don't you give us a little synopsis here on what's about to go down and all what right. to expect. Well, I'd like to invite everyone to play a, a game. I think you'll all like it. Uh, this is uh, Failed Log Lines, or uh, Log Lines <laughs> for Movies That Didn't Quite Make the Cut. What do we, what do we win? Uh, you win uh, the respect and admiration no. of millions of listeners. <laughs> I feel like you're going to say the respect want- and admiration of you. No, and I was like, that's a horrible not. prize. No. I don't want no. that. So, for, for example, uh, a log line might be, old lady tells a story about a boat while on a different boat. Titanic. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that, that's an easy one just to kind of <laughs> get, get you going. So I'm going to, okay. and uh, we'll just go down the list here. Uh, Carlton, we'll start with you. So the log line is, Transported to a surreal landscape, a young woman kills the first person she meets and then teams up with three strangers to kill again. <laughs> Can I help him out? <laughs> yes, you're going to have to. It's, it's late here, apparently. <laughs> You've never been to the land of Oz? Oh, very the good. land of Oz, yes. Yeah, there we go. All right. Uh, also, a politi- hey, also a political film, right? So. Yeah, trying to keep it in the theme here. Um, okay, uh, Kapil, uh, let's go to you. Um, okay. Uh, and to help you guys out, I'll also give you the decade the film was made. Okay. Okay. Professor skips office hours to find a misplaced box. 1980s. Oh, yeah. What? I'm out on this one, too. You can, you can phone a friend if you, you want to. You can phone a f- friend. Neil seems to be quite I, I good call at this. John, I call Johnny Blackburn. And I call Neil <laughs> Riley. <laughs> I'm going to say Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark was the one I was Raiders going of the Lost Ark. But, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, God. Uh, Matt, um, a political confrontation ensues after a structural flaw is discovered in a government building. 1970s. Erring Inferno? That's a that's uh that's that's, that's a good guess. Yeah, it's but, a good guess. Uh, this one was Star Wars, though. Uh, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? No, no. Silly me, I'm going and I'm going obscure. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Towering Inferno was good. I like that movie. I thought that was a really Although good. I think guess. that was the '60s, wasn't it? Or was that early '70s? Might have been early '70s. No '70s. Okay. That was '70s. Okay, Johnny. <laughs> Husband loses patience with his family at an all-inclusive winter resort. Oh, nineteen seventy. <laughs> That's an easy one. Come on. You gave them a shine in. Okay. Good job. Good job. <laughs> the I, only one that I knew. And Titanic, I guess. Neil. 
Kid has a close relationship with an older man who suffered a head injury, and the kid ends up kissing his mother. <laughs> oh, back to the future, baby. Which one? The first okay, one. Okay, good it. job. Okay. <laughs> I will right, we'll just do we'll just do one more for everybody. Um, okay, shouldn't we ask you one? No, I, I know the answers to everything. That's true. Uh, good point. <laughs> All right, Carlton. Um, a moody teen is sent to a room, and the mother asks for assistance from her priest to help guide the teen through her issues. <laughs> Poltergeist. Uh, the close. Yeah, the Exorcist is what I was thinking. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, there we go. Okay, Capella. There we go. Okay, Capella. Uh, man waiting yeah. on public transportation enjoys a box of confectionery treats while passing the time reminiscing about his life. <laughs> Boys go. <gone>. Yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, baby. <laughs> Second time it's been brought up today. Oh, mm. <laughs> hey, I don't right. give a flick. Uh, Matt. A father buys his son a pet and instruction instructs him on the care of the animal, but the son ignores the instructions. The son has to clean up after the pet. I'm going to go with uh, the first gremlins. Very good. Very yeah. good. Yeah, baby. <laughs> All right, Johnny. All right. Visitors do not respect the guest list at a Christmas party in an L.A. office building, and one of the executive's husbands <laughs> is not happy about it. Die Hard. Nice. Very good. Nice. Best Christmas movie ever. Just Best heads up. Christmas movie of all time. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, th thanks for having us. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. Appreciate right. y'all stopping well, by. All right, guys. <laughs> thanks for joining us. Uh, uh, from uh, yeah, from all of us here at I Don't Give a Flick. I'm Johnny. I'm Gary. I'm Neil. Stay classy. We'll see y'all next week. Thank you for tuning in to Leadfeather Productions' podcast of I Don't Give a Flick. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast so that you never miss an episode. Podcasts are available on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and everywhere podcasts are hosted. I Don't Give a Flick is hosted and produced by Johnny Blackburn, Gary Elmore, and Neil Riley. Executive producer, Johnny Blackburn. Technical director, editor, and audio mixer, Gary Elmore. I Don't Give a Flick is a Leadfeather production. Copyright Leadfeather Productions 2020.